Hi, everybody. Welcome to Preserving Family Photos. Uh, my name is Rachel Stock. I'm the local history librarian at the Field Library, and I am the administrator of the Colin T. Naylor Jr. Archives. Um, I want to thank my colleague Francisco Miranda for being here with me today. He's always a huge help, and so I like to start off um, on a note of gratitude. So thank you, Francisco, and thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm really excited about the program today. And uh, so without further ado, let's get started. So what we're going to discuss today is first steps. We're gonna talk about preservation basics, both in physical and digital formats. We are going to go over some storage tips and then we're going to end the program on some emergency planning notes. So first steps when it comes to gathering and assessing your collection, the very, very first thing that I would recommend is creating a workstation. This is before you get the photos out. This is before you're looking at your digital files. Um, very first step is to create a workstation based on your file format, whether it's a physical file, I'm sorry, whether it's a physical photograph or a digital file. Some of the things that I think might benefit you um, at your workstation, um, especially if you're working with physical photos, is um, a table. When I did this project for my family, I used my crafting table that I got at Joanne's Fabric. It doesn't have to be anything fancy like that, but um, just something big enough. Um, um, and also in a room that is doesn't have a lot of light in it where the kids aren't gonna come by and, um, you know, maybe get feel tempted to touch it with jelly finger, you know, jelly, uh, fingers or anything like that. Um, just somewhere where pets, children, other people um, won't be around where they can be kept safe. Um, I would also recommend a nice a light, a good light so that you can um, actually see the photographs, the physical photographs. Um, a magnifier glass is absolutely excellent for looking at the details in the background of photos. You would be so surprised what you could learn um, just looking in the back of a photo. This might help you identify um, what time period um, the photograph was taken or maybe who it was based on the locations. So um, definitely a magnifier glass. The most important thing that you need when you're working with photos, this isn't true for digital photos, but absolutely true for physical photos, you need to have white cotton gloves. Um, don't touch your photos without white cotton gloves. Um, it's fine to touch diplomas or other paper um, artifacts um, without gloves on, but when it comes to photos, um, they're very, very uh, vulnerable to oils and um, fingerprints and things like that. Um, so just have a white, white cotton gloves around so that when you're touching the photos, they're kept safe. Um, and this step, after you've created your workstation, I would gather everything um, up. The, the process of gathering can look like calling your Aunt May, who has, you know, a bunch of family photos and asking, you know, may I, um, may I take a look at those and, and work with them. Um, it might be going into your attic or your basement, um, but just get everything all together, the physical photos all together in one area. If they're digital photos, you know, you might want to start scouring Facebook or, um, you know, Flickr or, you know, other places where the photos might exist and put them all together in one place um, so that you can begin working with them. And part of the gathering process, the, the first step is the gathering process. And then the second sort of step within that um, is creating order um, and, and sorting. Um, this is where, when we have physical photos, a table comes in really handy. You can lay all the photographs out on the table. Um, if you have a large collection, you might need to do this 
um, in sections, but um, oftentimes when we are um, working with um, historical documents or older documents um, and, and we wanna know more about them, it really, it's hard to explain in words why this helps, but when you sit down to do it, um, you will understand. It just gives you kind of a, a global idea of what you're working with. Um, when you have them out on the table, you can look and say like, oh, gee, you know, we have a lot of photos from, you know, this family vacation or, um, you know, we don't really have any photos of Uncle Bob, you know, maybe we should call Aunt Rita and ask her if she has any photos of Uncle Bob, you know, so those sort of things. Um, this is also a really good time. And this is true for digital and physical um, photographs. Um, this is a good time to take notes. Um, it's a good time to uh, look at your physical photographs and notice any smudges, any dirt, um, tears, um, really anything that um, might impact the photo moving forward. Um, you wanna go ahead and note that so you can track over time um, your preservation needs of, of each individual photograph. Um, when you get them all laid out and you're looking at the collection as a whole, you're going to start to understand and be able to make decisions about how you're gonna physically organize the collection. And the one thing that I would say in this stage based on my experience processing archival collections is that you wanna think about before you even go any further, you want to think about how you want to think about your goals. How do you want this and what do you want out of this collection? If your answer is that you want to put these photos on Flickr so that everyone in your family can enjoy from the comfort of their own home, um, what you're going to do and how you move your project forward is going to be a lot different than say you just want to um, organize your photos and know what you have and you're going to you know put them back up in a storage space and you know monitor them um, in the years to come so this is a time when i would say um, establish a goal um, and and think about how access to these images um, is going to impact that goal and how and what and how you want that to look. Um, the next sort of step I would say is to create an inventory. This is the least fun part of the process. It's the most tedious. Um, it can be boring, not it can be boring, it's extremely boring. Um, and so I would recommend taking more time than you think that you will need to create this inventory. Depending on the size of your collection, you might not be able to sit down um, in one afternoon and create an inventory. So just kind of think about that. And the reason why inventories are important um, is it's going to help you know, A, which photographs you have, right? And then B, it's going to help you keep track of, of the physical condition of the photo. So you can create a note on an inventory that says left corner bent, beginning to see some deterioration. So that in 10 years, when you go back and look at that photo, you're like, oh, I didn't notice that, that thing in the corner. You can go on your inventory and you can see it. Oh, this is something that's been happening over time. Um, it's, it's not because of where or how I stored it. Um, so I would really encourage everyone, it's not the fun part um, of the process, but it's a really important part of the process. Um, and the last first step, I know this is gonna seem crazy to everybody, but um, throw things out, you know, you don't need the photo of uh, the blurry photo of a mountain in the distance. You don't need that. It's the more photos that you have in your collection, um, 
the more vulnerable they are to environmental damage. So I find in my experience that we need to balance the idea of having and preserving memories with what we're capable to store and how we can keep those documents and those photographs safe. Um, when I was a kid, I got a job and I saved my money up and I went and bought a Canon Rebel X. It was my first camera. Um, it was still back in the day when you um, sent your camera, your, you know, your photos to be processed. Um, and when I first got my camera, for whatever reason, I found all of these photographs of, I used to love to take pictures of my mom on the phone. I really don't know what I was thinking at the time. But when I was looking at this collection, I was very attached to the photo emotionally because I remembered that this was this period of time in my life when I went around taking random photos of my mom, um, much to her <laughs> chagrin. Um, so I decided to toss those because really there is no value to those. Um, the value was that I was learning how to be a photographer and learning how to take candid photos. Um, that doesn't need to be part of the family history. Um, and again, I just want to encourage everyone to think about balancing the size of your collection with your environmental, you know, your environment, um, what you're able to store, how much space you have, and all of those things. It's okay to throw things away. It is. It's okay. And it's necessary. Not everything has value. And, and think about the photos in the context of your family story. Does this photo have a importance to my family story? If the answer, like with my mom, random photos of my mom on the phone um, aren't important to family history, do not keep them. It's a burden to keep things that you don't need. Let them go. Um, I was very nervous to do this and, and I'm a professional. So um, I get where people might feel a little bit reticent about it, but truly go through and call your collection in the long run, you will be happier. This is the part of the presentation where I beg everyone listening to me now and in the future, when it comes to photographs, no paper clips, not even plastic ones, no tape, no glue, no colored paper, no sticky notes, no rubber bands, no nothing, nothing. Um, I have seen beautiful photographs destroyed by time, um, especially paper clips, they're metal, they rust, even the plastic ones create indentations. Um, they, they take off the layer of photographic material. Um, please just if you, I know that you want to keep things organized and you want to keep things, um, you know, sort of like with an explanation with it, please don't write on your photographs with pen, um, get an acid free piece of paper and a pencil. And, um, if you need to, um, fold the, as the, the photograph up, into a labeled piece of paper. Don't write on the, don't write on the paper when the photograph is in there. Do not use pen, only use pencil, but please, for the love of your family history, rubber bands are also really bad. Um, you know, people want to rubber band them um, to take them over for convenience. So they stay together um, and then they get put into a box and the rubber band what happens with rubber bands is they lose their humidity. They, they lose the humidity or the, and they become brittle and then they break and they tear off pieces of photographs. Um, so just, if you feel the need to organize your photos individually, use acid-free paper, do not, do not. And I, I don't wanna harp on this, but I've just seen it so many times, any kind of glue cement uh rubber cement when that came out people would put 
I've just seen a lot of damage. Don't glue anything um, and just be aware of that. I'm not going to keep harping on it, but I've just seen so much damage um, that I just want to remind everybody. So moving forward um, after those sort of first steps and uh, the caveat about um, no paper clips, um, I want you to remember something that I say probably like 50 times a week is it depends. There are no hard and, and fast rules here for the most part besides paper clips um, <laughs> that you have to follow. It really does depend on each individual photograph, when the photograph was created, uh, the, you know, the year it was taken, what kind of photograph it is. Is it a Polaroid? Is it a um, albumin print? Is it, is it a glass plate negative? It really does depend on a lot of things. So as I move forward to tell you about the next little, you know, few little pieces of insight, just remember that it depends and that each photograph might have unique needs that you have to maybe look up at the end of the program. I'll give you resources for that, um, how to properly care for that. So just remember that um, it really does depend. Um, and archivists all over the planet will tell you that. Um, and so just bear that in mind. Um, what might be good for your, for your, Polaroid might not be good for, you know, the, the photos that you had that you took in the 90s. So just, um, just bear that in mind. So moving on, moving on uh, the next thing that we're going to discuss is uh, preservation basics um, in terms of proper storage. Now, the basically the same thing um, for physical photos and, you know, digital hard drives. Um, it's basically the same, but, um, just so that, you know, this slide is, uh, more geared towards physical photographs. So you want to find in your home, a cool, dry place, preferably that doesn't have any windows or light. Um, I'm going to talk about this next point last, but when you are storing your photographs, the best type of box to use is an acid free box. You can get those at Joanne's Fabric, you can get them at photography shops, you can get them on Amazon, you can get them a lot of places, you would be surprised, um, you know, until I uh, started seeking them out for my for my family collection, I didn't realize how widely available they were to the public, especially now that Amazon is around. Um, if you just type acid free boxes, um, don't get caught up in, in how the box looks. Uh, if it's plain and white, that's what you want, uh, or gray, sometimes they, they come in kind of like a cream colored, but um, don't go to Joann's and buy at Christmas time, you know, they have all the cute snowmen or like at Valentine's Day, they have those boxes that has the paper on it. Going back to what I said about uh, colored paper, just whatever is most boring. Uh, think of that. <laughs> um, and, and again, just take a look on Amazon. Truly, if you even just uh, really quickly at Google, or even if you go to Walmart, I'm, I'm not 100% positive that Walmart would have it, but I'm pretty sure. Um, another thing that you would probably have to, to get online um, is uh, polypropylene sleeves. Um, this is so that you can touch your photographs and, sh and, and share them and view them without damaging their sleeve, without damaging the photographs. So, you know, go, earlier I told you that it's a good idea to decide what you want with these photographs, um, what your goals are. So some of the photographs, the family photographs that you have, they might be so cool that you just want to show, you know, everyone at every family read, oh my gosh, look at this photo, have you seen it? Um, and then there's other photos that you will just want to kind of keep, you know, in, in a box somewhere. 
every time I just want to let you know, every time you pull a photo out of those polypropylene sleeves, you're doing damage. Anytime a photo has anything rubbing up against it, you're potentially doing damage to it. Even photos up against each other. That's why um, you want to handle the photos as little as possible. And that's also why digitization of photos is a it's not something the process we're going to cover today, but it's something that you definitely want to look into just for preservation sake. So that instead of, of having to pull those photos out of the sleeves to, to work with them. Um, and then of course, um, I just want to remind everybody that white cotton gloves um, are the only thing that can touch a photo. Don't touch a photo with your bare skin over time. It will ruin it. Um, and then the last thing that I want to talk about before we discuss environments um, is to think creatively about storage spaces. Um, my parents, I grew up in a um, really old uh, Victorian home, you know, think uh, red brick with like a white wraparound porch, um, you know, a baked like a brick oven in the summer and um, it could be a little drafty in the winter. The very best place in my parents' house um, is, is in my mom and dad's closet. Um, it goes underneath the stairwell. Um, and it's, it's in the middle of, in the middle of the house. Um, so, I mean, obviously my mom would rather have clothing in her closet on the top shelf, but I recommended to her that she put the family photos there, um, because that's where the environment is the most stable in that house. So just kind of think, you don't have to think about it. Um, you know, you might have to sacrifice. For example, my mom puts where those photographs are. My mom uses um, in her in her house, There's we call it the computer room. She uses um, that space uh, for the space that she lost in her closet. So um, just think about that. Um, and, and then sort of on that note, and with that in mind, um, I wanna talk about the difference between creating the perfect environment versus a stable environment. Um, there's a lot, when you go online, if you go online and you read about this, there's a lot of pages that will give you specific relative humidity and specific temperatures. I am of the mind that there, there and I know this for a fact, <laughs> Um, there's no such thing as a perfect environment. Um, every house is different. Every day, the weather is different. Um, it's really hard to keep an environment consistent. I've worked in archives in multi-million dollar facilities, um, at state archives, um, university archives, and it's, it's, impossible <laughs> um, to keep a perfect environment. Don't set yourself up for that crazy, you know, to be driven crazy that way. Um, what you really wanna think about is fluctuations. You know, that closet in my parents' bedroom um, tucked in the back, um, again, it's in the middle of the house. There's no windows, there's appropriate airflow, but it doesn't, you know, there's not like a vent that's blowing, you know, air down, it's, you know, it's up on a shelf. Um, and it, it's the least fluctuating area of the house. You can go to Home Depot uh, um, or Lowe's or whatever and buy a relatively cheap, you know, they're those little boxes and it has the relative humidity on it. You know, that, for 11 or $12, you can invest in one of those and kind of do experiments around your house. But generally speaking, I would, um, unless you have some amazing insulation or you've, um, your basement is, is finished, I would say no basements. I would say no attics. It would, you know, preferably be kind of in the middle of the house um, on either the first or second floor, depending on your situation. Um, don't, again, don't drive yourself crazy. There's, there's all these websites out there that, that give you all these real specific. Um, so for example, it's, you know, temperature wise photographs need to be stored in an archival environment. Um, the archival standard, um, to not go above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
um, and to keep it somewhere in the range of 30 to 50%. Anything lower um, can make things too brittle. Anything higher obviously invites mold. Even when you invest millions of dollars in HVAC systems, it's not perfect. It's, it's not a perfect science. Don't drive yourself crazy. I have um, in, in a professional context, um, trying to keep things perfect. And it, I promise you, it doesn't exist. So um, just again, don't freak out about the numbers. Just kind of try to find the most stable. Fluctuations are the most damaging. Now moving into preservation basics. So that was pretty, you know, pretty much about physical um, photographs, but let's take a look. Let's, let's transition to talking about the basics of uh, digitization. Um, I'm not going to talk about digitization in this, um, in this presentation because it would take way too long. Um, but some things to keep in mind as you're processing your collection, you know, those first steps that I talked about getting everything laid out. Um, as you're processing and as you're looking at everything, um, there's some, you know, sort of um, steps or things that you should be aware of um, before you begin that process. Um, the first, the first thing is naming conventions. Um, establish a naming convention, and this is true for physical photographs too. Um, what I would recommend for physical photographs is, uh, is what we do in the archival community and world is we, we label them Z1 through Z however many you have. Um, that's one way of labeling physical photos. Um, so that way when you're going back to look them up, um, you have, uh, you know, you you it'll be easier recall will be easier for you um with digital photos um what i would say is depending on your project use your family name and the date um and and be aware of um when you're when you're deciding on naming conventions for your it, and it doesn't have to be any way it doesn't have to be your family name and your date it absolutely doesn't have to be it can be whatever you want it to be but pick a convention and stick to it um and and this will happen to you where you get 50 photographs in and you're like geez i really don't like that naming convention i want to change it it's okay to change it at that point but just know that you're gonna have to go back and change every photo before that. In order to stay organized, in order to keep track of everything and to know what you have and you don't have, choose a naming convention. There's articles on the internet about naming conventions. There's um, there's actually internet international standards about it. Um, so so go do a search and and kind of take a look. Um, you want your your title the title to be descriptive as possible. Um, and to be able to be um, sort of understood if you're not there, you know, there has to be some kind of, you know, you've got to be able to make sense of it. Um, the next thing that I want to discuss in terms of digitization and preservation um, is your file size and your type. Um, I know I said I wasn't going to get into the, the specifics, but um, if you're you know, thinking about this project and you haven't done it yet, just, you know, sort of something to think about um, would be that when you get to the point where you're actually digitizing and you're saving them, um, you want your photos to be saved at the highest resolution possible for your budget. Um, and so we all know photographs take up a lot of space um, on, on a hard drive. So um, you've got to be able to balance that. Um, if you know you have 15 terabytes of which that's just crazy um so if you have an entire terabyte of photos um you know how high the resolution that you save them is going to impact that um you want to save at the highest as possible because moving forward um you're going to want to have that digital file be as, as best as it can moving forward. Um, so 
some things to keep in mind. Um, so like with JPEGs, um, and so this is why this matters in terms of resolution. So like with JPEGs, um, you have the original JPEG picture and you upload it and you put it on Facebook and Aunt May sees that and she's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I haven't seen that photo in 30 years. And she right clicks it and she saves it to her computer. That file is now more compressed and has less data in it. So digital photos are made up of hundreds of thousands of little pieces of data. They're numbers actually. Um, and when you right click and you save some of those numbers, some of that data is taken away and the photo is compressed and you're gonna lose quality over time. That's why it's important to have an original that only lives on a drive so that 50 years from now, when that photo has been you know, right-clicked 800 times, you're gonna still have that original photo and, and the resolution and the quality for it. Um, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is to save your file in two types. The first would be a JPEG is what I would recommend. And then the second would be a TIFF. Um, depending on your, you know, sort of um, technical knowledge, um, you'll notice that there are a lot of different kinds of photo files. JPEGs and TIFF are the two that, in my professional opinion, as well as the opinion of people who create international standards, they believe that these two file types have the best chance of being able to be read in the future. Um, if we think about VHS tapes, right? So VHS tapes can only be read with a VCR. These, the way that we view information is going to change. The, the way that we access that information is going to change. When you are going to move forward and, and change your image types. Let's say your granddaughter in 25 years is going to get a hold of these photos. You want them to be in a standard that is internationally recognized because it will be easier to get the software that you might need to view those photos. So just keep that in mind. Um, I think a lot of people think about physical photos as more vulnerable. Um, but I would argue that in some ways, especially when it comes to file size and type, collections are very vulnerable to um, not being able to be viewed because you don't have uh, the proper equipment or the proper computer program to read them. So um, those are the two, two, two file types, um, JPEG and TIFF. Um, as high as a, a resolution as possible, um, you don't go too high. There's no reason to save too much, but you know, kind of find that that middle ground um, for yourself. Um, and um, again, if you need, if you get into the into it, and you're like, oh, I don't know what is the proper file size, uh, you can shoot me an email. You can look online, um, and I will be happy to uh, to fill you in um, with those details. Um, again, this is sort of just as you're planning. Um, a flatbed, flatbed scanners are so incredibly affordable now. It's amazing. Um, it really is. It really is incredible how affordable they are. Um, so anyone at home now at this point, you know, you can, it does, it's not an, a, a huge investment. Um, but when you go to purchase one, make sure that you look for the resolution specs on how far, you know, what it can save up to so that going back to sort of like, you know, the JPEG and the TIFF uh, file types, um, you're going to be able to get the archival quality or the, the preservation quality that you're going for. Um, and then um, sort of as a next final tip in preservation basics, uh, your digital photos need to be backed up in three places. Yes, three. You need to back it up on a cloud. You need to get yourself two portable drives, portable hard drives, uh, and preferably you want them stored in different places. Yes, really, three places. I know that sounds absurd, 
um, and that seems crazy. Um, and it is an archival standard, but I tell all of my patrons and anyone um, that I discuss this with ever three places. One place is on a cloud. It can be Verizon. Um, it can be Google Cloud has a cloud. Apple has a cloud. There's a ton of cloud storage spaces options out there. Um, the clouds actually back their data up in three different places. So um, it's just a it's best practice. It's not going to matter until it matters. And then you're going to remember that I said this and you're going to be like, oh, why didn't I listen to her? I mean it. Three places. Um, one on the cloud, two drives. The two disk drive or the two portable drives that these photos are on, um, I recommend trying to split them up as much as possible. Send one to Uncle Bob in Florida and then one to Aunt Ruth in Oregon. Um, different environments, different hazards, different um, different places. So if something happens at Uncle Bob's, that's, you know, God forbid something happens, we can always count on Aunt Ruth's backup copy. Another thing that I tell patrons is that these drives need to be backed up every four years, um, depending on the amount of use. Four years seems like really, you know, what am I going to do every four years? Give those drives to your college cousin. You'll, you know, you'll find reasons to have to have those drives. Um, you can sell them on Facebook Marketplace or somewhere, um, but do replace them every four years. The reason I say four is because five seems to be kind of like, in my experience, the year that they sort of um, fizzle out. That really depends on how much use that you get. Um, I would say when you're working with these drives, don't leave them plugged in to the USB. Every time it's plugged in and it's used, it's, it's using a little bit more of the life of the product. Replace them every four years, even if nothing appears to be wrong with them, because you don't want to be taking your drive, crying, at least this would be me, to a computer place and saying, oh my God, I have you know, my mother's wedding photos. Um, can you please get them off of here? You know, you don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen to you. Um, so please, um, every four years. Um, and the other thing that I want to say is that these drives should be not for other things. Don't save anything else on them. These are photos. You don't want the drive plugged into your computer. You save something on, on it and you accidentally give a virus to these drives. They, they should just Basically, if you have physical and digital photos, I would just put the drives in the same place as the physical photos, frankly, and just leave them there and don't think about them like they don't exist. Um, when I was in, I mean, even before college, I, um, I remember uh, getting my first USB stick, you know, and it was like $40 and it was like, you know, 15, you know megabytes of space. Storage is really affordable now. You can find, I wish I had mine out. Um, I, I use um, Western Digital's um, Passport Drive. I really like it. It's enough space for me. Um, take a look around at the options, go to, you know, Best Buy and ask them and, and just let them know, you know, um, and they'll be able to point you towards something um, appropriate. Again, don't share these drives with other projects. I'm, and don't share them with other projects. I promise you won't regret it. <laughs> so let's talk about emergencies, being prepared. I'm always, I, I like to think of myself as someone who's always thinking ahead, wants to be prepared for just in case. Um, my uh, Cam Schroeder, um, one of my very favorite instructors at Wayne State University told me at one point or told the class, um, you're going to walk into your archive someday and there's going to be an emergency and there is going to be nothing that you could do about it. Um, the best that you can do is prepare ahead of time. So with that in mind, I wanna share with you some tips that I have about that. Um, one of the ways that you can prepare ahead of time is by considering your geographic location. Um, I moved to New York a year ago. I did not know that hurricanes were a thing. They're a thing here. Um, 
depending on where you're at, um, you might have to uh, deal with hurricanes. You might be out in California in you know, fire prone areas. Um, earthquakes could happen near you, tornadoes. There's all kinds of emergencies that can happen. So when you're making a plan uh, for your emergencies, you really wanna think about your geographic region. So we don't wanna put, generally speaking, anything on the floor um, because that's prone to flooding. Um, we want stuff, you know, pretty high up, um, no matter what, uh, but just think about your geographic region and then think about how your individual home responds to, um, responds to emergencies. Uh, I, it was so hard, um, as an archivist to see so many people's family photos and, and things destroyed by Hurricane Ida. It was, it was just heartbreaking to me. Um, so think about not only your geographic region, but your individual home. Does your basement flood? If the answer is yes, it, that's not a good place for your photos. I mean, obviously, but you'd be surprised what people, um, what people do. So, um, you know, another house, you know, it might be too hot um, in certain areas. So it really does depend on the geographic region on the individual home. Um, the last thing that I will say on, well, actually there's two things that I wanna say. The first is um, during Hurricane Ida, or maybe it was Henri, I can't remember which of the hurricanes it was, um, but I read an account of somebody who had, uh, right before they left their house, um, before flooding, you know, obviously I'm, Absolutely not saying to risk your life to do this, but this particular person had enough time to prepare before they left. So I'm not suggesting that as water is rushing into your house that you try to save your photographs. That's your life is more important, but this per particular person had a little time before they had to leave their house. They shoved all of their photographs. They wrapped it up in plastic bags, all the plastic bags they could find and they shoved them into a contico and they put it on top of their bookshelf. And they said that the one thing um, that wasn't destroyed um, was this, you know, family, you know, these family photos. Don't, don't put your photographs in plastic. Um, it's really bad for it, but I would say in the short term, it saved the whole collection. So it being in a little, you know, some plastic bags and in a plastic bin for a week is fine, but don't, don't over prepare. So don't freak out and, and leave them in the plastic bins, but don't under prepare and think on your toes. Do not risk your life, obviously, um, for your photos. Um, but, uh, do, um, if you do have time, you know, uh, do think about that. Um, and then, so on a final note, in terms of emergencies, uh, fire is the one thing. Um, so my instructor, Professor Schroeder told us that there are a lot of things that you can get back. You know, it might not be perfect, but you can get them back. The one thing is fire. There's just nothing, there's just really nothing that you can do. Um, so, one sort of work around, um, you know, depending on the size of the fire, um, you could put a fire extinguisher next to the collection, um, you know, and, and if, you know, I mean, I can't imagine a scenario in which this would happen, but emergencies are scenarios that you can't imagine. So um, again, the fire, sort of the fire idea that's why storing your digital files in two different places is a really good idea. Um, Uncle Bob's house burns down, you know, but Aunt Ruth is fine in Oregon. So um, think about those things, think about emergencies, think about it in terms of your geographic region and then your individual homes. Um, and you will be more prepared. Um, it's emergencies, environmental emergencies, I can tell you from personal experience are completely devastating. It's, it's really hard um to deal with an environmental emergency in your collection um but as long as you're as prepared as possible you can do your best 
So to round out our presentation today, I just wanted to share a quick few three resources with you. Um, I, I love telling people about the stuff they can find. So um, I, uh, I kind of limited it this time. I didn't want to, you know, get too crazy and, and go off into all of these, these places and show you all these cool things. But I did find three particular places that I wanted to point out to you. Um, the first is, uh, is NARA. Um, the National Archives um, has, which you can find at archives.gov, has an amazing resource. Uh, as you can see up here, you went from home to preservation to how to preserve family photos to storing family photographs and papers. Um, so this just has really great photos. See this? We don't want this, especially not with photographs. They'll bend and it'll ruin them. These are the archival quality or, you know, the, the box, um, acid-free boxes. These ones, particular ones happen to be gray. Um, but again, you know, it gives you tips. You don't want photos hanging out the edges. Um, and so um, this is just something that I want you to be aware of that you can have and, and, and take a look at um, if you need it. Um, the next, the next resource I decided to share because it is, um, it is archival quality, um, resources, um, for, um, um, your, uh, family photos. So they give you a nice family photo 101 a video, um, and they give you six steps to photo organization. As you can see, they actually put create an inventory, as I had mentioned before, the most boring part of this process, but also one of the most important. Um, so take a look at their, um, at their uh, resources if you want to. Um, I'm not um, promoting them, um, but this is a place that you can go if you need to, um, to order uh, acid-free boxes. Um, look around everywhere and try to get yourself you know, the best, the best price and the best deal. Um, there's no reason Gaylord's very, a very popular, um, uh, place, but there's no reason that you absolutely have to go there. Um, I just picked this particular one, like I said, because it had the other steps on here. Um, and then finally, I really liked this New York times article because it was just very readable and, um, and had a lot of good things to share. Um, and it just, uh, it's, it's very readable is mainly why I chose this. Um, they give a lot of really great tips. Um, oh, their index card idea. I really love this. And this goes back to not um, paper clipping things. Um, getting a simple index card um, and writing out information. I really love index cards. I use them a lot before I put things onto a digital database, but you can figure out whatever, you know, the system that works best for you. But if you are interested, um, this is a really great uh, resource for that. And then the other thing we talk about this in art, in this article that I, I want to um, discuss, um, just like the paper clips, the other thing that I see all the time um, is damage from ink pens. Um, ink pens, ink is horrible. Uh, markers are horrible. The only, if you have to write on it, I don't recommend writing on it at all, but if you absolutely must, please use a number two pencil. Um, that will be better for your photograph in the long run. And um, so yes, um, those are the resources. There's a lot more out there. Um, if you look through these and it doesn't answer your question completely, I'd be, I'd love to help you um, with some other resources. I, I didn't want to overwhelm or spend a whole lot of time um, dissecting resources. All probably one of my favorite things to do. Um, so uh, again, reach out if you have any questions. Um, and with that, um, we're going to end the presentation. Um, if you have questions, I would love to hear them. Um, this uh, it, photograph is, is a photograph of my brother, uh, myself, and, and my grandpa, um, who was my Batman. He was um, amazing. I love having this photo. Um, I have it in physical and digital form. 
um, and I love preserving it so we can have it, um, you know, far, far into the future. So thank you so much for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them.